Welcome. You are about to view a recorded talk from the online seminar series Progress and Visions in the Scientific Study of the Mind-Matter Relation, held in 2018. The seminars aim to bring together researchers from around the globe with a background in mathematics or physics who are interested in the scientific study of consciousness and the mind-matter relation. While each seminar session consists of a talk and a discussion, the latter is not recorded and the following video will only contain the talk. We hope you enjoy it. For further information, please visit mind-matter-relation.org. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And the title of today's talk is Interfaces, Conscious Agents, and the Invention of Structure. And I, I, I apologize uh, that I, I have to use a PDF because my keynote didn't seem to function very well with this. So um, actually, it may work out better because the keynote was probably too dramatic. Um, so the next slide is uh, that this has to do with the interface theory of perception and what we call conscious realism. Uh, which, as you'll see, is a provocative word. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the objective of this talk is actually just to give you a synopsis of, of these theories. But uh, in order to be somewhat dramatic, I'd say that this talk, I will show that evolution by natural selection entails that physicalism is false. Uh, that's our claim. That the, uh, you, and and I, I'll hope to... Uh, to go some distance to convincing you of this. Um, so first of all, uh, let me describe what physicalist theories are in, in my view. Um, and the basic idea is that perception, our perceptions are reconstructions, um, by, by which we mean that there are certain assumptions, the first of which is that we are reconstructing an objective world. OK, so um, <clears throat> First assumption is that our perceptions estimate true properties of the physical world, an objective physical world. Um, uh, secondly, oh, it's not really working. Maybe you can try uh, control click. Whoops, that didn't work. Um, it's not working? Function click. That seems okay. to work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Evolution guarantees that these estimates are accurate. This is the uh, received wisdom throughout uh, cognitive science and, and perception science and in physics and, and our physical sciences that we believe that evolution uh, has, has led us to evolve uh, more and more accurate perceptions of the physical world. Um, so, uh, well, it works, kind of. So physical <laughs> objects have causal powers and um, <clears throat> brain activity causes consciousness. Okay, so if, if physical objects have causal powers, neurons are physical objects and, and they cause consciousness. So these are the, the basic assumptions of physicalism that I want to address. Um, so I want to question these assumptions and uh, uh, for example, the assumption that perception is veridical um, is questionable on various fronts. I, I won't go into details, but we all know about visual illusions and so forth. Um, there's a, a famous illusion from Color From Motion, which um, uh, I can't show you the slide because it won't work on PDF, but uh, as these these dots change their color from black to blue, you, 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 you tend, even now you can sort of see a blue background, which isn't actually there. Another example is a Necker cube, which it doesn't exist in 3D, but we see it in one of two um, uh, configurations in 3D, um, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. And I won't belabor it. Um, uh, we'll go on to the next assumption, whether natural selection favors veridical perceptions. And uh, I, I, uh, there, there are various, um, there, there are lots of examples from biology where, which seem to indicate that it really doesn't. I'll just show you one from Canada, which is the famous moose mating mistake. Um, this happens a lot, apparently, because uh, apparently in Canada, they have a lot of statues of, of bisons, which are mistaken by moose um, rather dramatically. Anyway, so uh, <clears throat> just to uh, throw out a big name, uh, like to mention what Steven Pinker said and how the mind works. He said that we are organisms, not angels. It's an interesting comment. And our minds are organs, not pipelines to the truth. Our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. <clears throat> so a, a, a major researcher in the field uh, seems to believe that uh, our perceptions may well not be veridical. 
So the idea is that we should start with an evolutionary theory of perception. Okay, and by evolutionary theory, I mean, um, <clears throat> let me come back to this uh, later. Um, I think I lost, I lost this slide over here. Um, well, by evolutionary theory, I mean that we're going to use uh, evolutionary game theory. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, there was lots of stuff in this slide. But es essentially, evolutionary game theory is a, is a theory which is ontologically neutral. It doesn't uh, specify um, any particular ontology. It's just the natural, the most natural theory we know uh, of the adaptation of a species to its, its world. And so uh, I think Daniel Dennett, who... Um, uh, takes a very physicalistic point of view, uh, believes in evolutionary game theory as as sort of an acid test, with, which can be applied to any other theory to see whether it, it, it satisfies the very fundamental ideas of evolution. Um, and that's what this slide was actually about. Um, it's also, uh, the, so that's one of the mathematical uh, um, theories that we're going to employ. The other mathematical theories are going to be probability theory and Bayesian uh, inference, which is standard in perception science also. Um, and um, and when we use probability theory, I'm, I, I'm not going to take a particular point of view, though I think what I'm going to suggest will uh, lead to the idea of subjective probabilities as being the approach we need to take. Um, and then I'll also talk about geometry and um, uh, as, as a way of describing space and space-time. Um, so I'm going to be stating three theorems. The first theorem is going to say that interface agents, a certain kind of agent that is attuned to fitness, not necessarily to veridicality or to uh, a the true objective world, that interface agents will dominate under natural selection agents seeing the truth. Um, dominate means they'll drive them to extinction. Um, <clears throat> the second theorem I'm going to uh, mention later is the, the theorem that says that conscious agents, which I will define as we go along, these impute spatial tr structure to the world, even if the world that they are in may not have that structure. Okay, and uh, the, the, there's probably a whole sequence of structure theorems that we can prove in this context. The next one, the, the last one that I will talk about is, is the imputation of, of probabilistic structure in the world, which again, does not have to have that structure. It's a structure which is sort of internal to the agent, but that's how it sees the world. So these three theorems are presented with, in an attempt to sort of demonstrate that physicalism is false. Okay, so let's go to the first theorem. Uh, the first theorem is, um, is basically about playing an evolutionary game between two types of um, strategies. One is a, the physicalist evolutionary strategy and the other one is, is what we call the interface strategy. So what is a physicalist evolutionary theory? It's a theory in which our perceptions have evolved as more or less veridical representations of the objective world, or maybe I should say of an objective world. Um, <clears throat> and so in, in physicalist evolutionary theories, veridical perceptions are those that are attuned to this, the actual structure of the world. Okay, so that's going to be one kind of strategy that we will talk about. Uh, Don Hoffman introduced uh, the interface theory of um, perception, so I call it his interface evolutionary theory also because it describes uh, perceptions which have evolved not to commune with the truth, but which have evolved as efficient user interfaces between us as a species and an objective world. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, Interface perceptions are those which are attuned to evolutionary fitness, okay? And the, the idea over here then is, well, there's a little slide over here which says that evolutionary fitness can depend on who you are. Um, this, is, this has many fitness points for the lion. Uh, this has few fitness points for the rabbit. In fact, the rabbit may not even objectify the slab of meat. It, it may not have a name for it or, or a way of recognizing it as, as separate from its environment. Of course, the lion is now very confused about whether he wants fresh meat or not. Um, uh, okay, so moving on. Uh, ah, here's the slide that I thought I'd missed. 
Um, so I've already talked about this, but I might um, I might quote Dennett in, when, when he talks about evolutionary game theory, um, that whether evolution has a purpose or not, it's the mechanism for the adaptation of a species to its world. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've talked about Bayesian inference and um, group theory and geometry already. So I apologize again. These, these slides were supposed to all dramatically come together. But... Uh, <laughs> Chitan, we can, if you like, we can go back to um, PowerPoint. Just you will not be able to see us. If you prefer that, we could do that, like to keynote. Well, it, it, yeah, it, let me just give that a little try for a moment. Yeah. Good. So uh, I'm going to describe uh, the states of the world. Uh, we're assuming the existence of an objective world. And uh, it's going to be... For example, a closed rectangle in some k-dimensional Euclidean space is a compact regular Borel space. And this is basically, a lot of this is just to allow us to be able to do Bayesian inference. Uh, so in order to perform the Bayesian inference, we will assume that W has an a priori probability measure on its, on its probabilistic structure, uh, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the uniform measure on, on, on uh, on the states of the world and so it has a continuous density so i'm just putting this up in order to uh, you know uh, point out the well-known uh, <clears throat> bayesian inference procedure um, the density being continuous achieves its maximum on on the set w and that allows us to do maximum a posteriori uh, estimates Okay, we'll also assume that uh, any given species interacts with its world employing a finite perceptual space. Um, and, and this is the sort of thing, this sort of model is fairly standard in, uh, in perception science and cognitive science. Okay, so uh, we're going to model two perceptual strategies. Um, so we have a set of world states W, a perceptual space X. And an ideal perceptual strategy then assigns a percept to each world state. Um, now, you might say that some world states will not light up uh, in one's perceptual space, but that can be included as, as kind of an extra point in the perceptual space. Um, this is what we call an ideal strategy. In, in reality, most perceptual strategies have some dispersion in them. So a general perceptual strategy allows for this dispersion. And uh, in that case, P is no longer just a simple uh, punctual function, it, it should be thought of as a Markovian kernel. So that P uh, of Wx is the probability that when the world state is W, the organism's perception is X. Okay, and I'll sort of go back and forth between these, uh, the ideal and the general, uh, as is convenient. Um, <clears throat> so what's fitness? Well, fitness is a very simple thing. There's a fitness function or a fitness landscape is something that's specific to the species, environment, and action class of uh, the particular species. But given these, it assigns to each world state W a positive number, its fitness. Okay, so fitness is simply here seen as a, as a non-negative function on the set of world states. So um, the veridical or truth strategies do uh, perform their, their, their perception in the following way. They first use Bayes' theorem to estimate for each possible percept X the, uh, a maximum a posterior world state that could have given rise to X. And that's where we, is the first use of our Bayes' formula, which where you look at the a posterior probability uh, given by, this is essentially Bayes' formula in this context. And the reason you see this P inverse of X happening over here is that there's a perceptual map P from the world to uh, the perceptual states. And this is the collection of um, world states that could have given rise to X. Okay, so um, we'll call that maximum a posteriori world state W sub X. And that's the one that basically maximizes G of W over here. What's every, everything else is pretty much a constant. Um, so this just illustrates that idea uh, that there's a fiber above X. If P is a, uh, actually a function, then there's a fiber above X where one of the world states that could have given rise to uh, that X will be the maximum of posterior estimate. 
Okay, so the second thing that a perceptual truth strategy does is to employ the fitness. It chooses that percept which has maximum fitness from among the map estimates. So you get a map estimate for each X, and then you maximize the fitness of that map state uh, over all of these maps states. And uh, any such will be called um, uh, the... Uh, sorry, let me. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, will be will be the strategy. Will be the perception. Okay. So, um, for the interface uh, observer or the interface strategy, we need to define what is meant by fitness of a percept X itself, and that is simply the average of the fitnesses of all the world states that could have given rise to it. In other words, it's the average over the fiber. <coughs> um, of the fitnesses, you can see that over here in this formula, it's a sort of modified base formula, um, and that's the average fitness of each percept. Okay, um, so the interface strategies then first compute the average fitness of each fiber over each x of the perceptual map P, and then they choose that percept X sub zero that maximizes the average fitness of its fiber. Okay, so it's a somewhat different strategy. It's based only on fitness. It's not looking for uh, an estimate of, of the best world state in particular. Okay, so which of these strategies dominates? And um, just a brief tutorial on evolutionary game theory. Um, uh, an evolutionary game is between any two strategies, in this case, interface and truth, it can be described in terms of its payoff matrix, uh, matrix um, where A, B, C, and D are the payoffs of each strategy being played against either itself or the other strategy. And it's a general theorem then in, in evolutionary game theory that the that interface will dominate truth, which is what I claim it will most of the time, um, if uh, the payoffs to interface in each case, exceed those to truth as the first player, okay, regardless of who the second player is. So A would have to be bigger than or equal to C, and B would have to be bigger than or equal to D. Um, and at least one of these is a strict inequality. If neither is, is strict, then at least interface will not be dominated by truth. Okay, so let's see. Well, what happens is that then you, you, you run the... Um, um, uh, the replicator equation, which is based on these ideas, that if xi is the proportion of species using strategy i and xt is the proportion of species, species using strategy t, then the fitnesses are given in terms of the payoff by these uh, formulas. And the replicator equation then is a differential equation that, that tells you what's going to happen over repeated uh, plays of the game. Um, and the general theorem, which I've lifted from Novak's evolutionary dynamics, is that these are the five possible things that can happen. Um, the first four are, are sort of generic. The last one only happens if you have exact equality. Okay, but um, I, you know, either you, one will dominate the other, or there'll be a, a bistable condition where you have an unstable equilibrium, or there'll be a stable equilibrium, uh, or just neutral equilibrium. Um, so what we claim in this case is that in the first theorem is that interface theories dominate truth strategies in the following sense. So if you consider a world W in a finite sensorium X that's fixed, then over all possible fitness functions and all possible a priori probability measures on W, we're, we're sort of uh, looking at all possibilities, we're looking at the generic situation, then the probability that an interface perceptual strategy will dominate a veridical strategy is at least given by this quantity. The size of the sensorium is uh, the absolute, is, is X. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing. What it means is that um, as the size of the perceptual space increases, without bound, the probability with which interface strategies will dominate veridical strategies goes to one, uh, generically in a priori measures and fitness functions. Now, uh, earlier on, the, the, some research was done by uh, Don Hoffman and his graduate students using simulations, and, and that's pretty much what those simulations showed. Um, now we actually have a theorem that, that justifies the results of those simulations. 
Um, <clears throat> so the implication then, the implication of this is that our physical vocabulary as an extension of our perceptual predicate vocabulary is the wrong vocabulary for the causal structure of the real world. So that's, I think, a reasonable conclusion if you buy the theorem and its applicability. Um, what that suggests is uh, that, well, of course, there, there are going to be a lot of objections. Uh, for example, the one objection is, uh, don't fitness functions correspond to the truth? Uh, in some sense, aren't they homomorphic to uh, the objective structure of the real world? Well, the problem is that they're the set of functions homomorphic to any structural conditions on any set. Uh, you know, you can think of all sorts of possible structural conditions, any any mathematical conditions at all, is is going to be minuscule. Sorry, I misspelled minuscule. Amongst all possible functions in the limit is the size of the world. In, well, in the you know, for any reasonable world, for any reasonable number of a few million species. Okay, so that's one answer to that objection. Uh, another objection. Well, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, There's a famous statement by Bertrand Russell who said that whatever we infer from perceptions, it is only structure that we can validly infer. And I think uh, this theorem uh, suggests that we agree with that, but what we agree is somewhat different from what he meant. He, I think he meant the structure of the world, but I think all we can say is that it's the structure of our perceptions uh, in, in in, in a way that that attunes to is you know which are doing satisfying solutions for fitness points. Um, another objection to the domination theorem could uh, go as follows: there is consistent agreement on things like three D shapes, textures, and so on. How can you say that these are fictions of our interface? Um, well, there's another theorem coming up. These are very strong intuitions. We all sort of naturally or habitually believe them. Uh, but according to the theorems coming up, I think these intuitions are dead false. Um, for example, an agent can see space or probabilities as properties of the world, whether the world actually has those structures or not. Okay, so let's, uh, ah, well, here are a couple more quotes just for, to give us a little break. Uh, Thomas Huxley, the famous biologist uh, from the end of the 19th and beginning of 20th century said, um, that basically a state of consciousness arising from nervous tissue is just like Aladdin rubbing his lamp. Uh, Galileo himself thought that tastes, odors, colors, and so on reside in consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were removed, all these qualities would be wiped away. So um, I'm not a philosopher. I should say this right up front, and I'm, I really would love to hear people's comments in, in these directions as uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so this all suggests the interface theory, um, where we think of space-time as akin to a desktop, an interface, uh, well, a, a sort of a, a geometrization of an interface, which allows us to locate things on that interface. Physical objects are akin to icons on a desktop. Um, icons seem to interact via physical law, but physical causality is a fiction because all of this is happening on a desktop. It's not necessarily what's happening in the real world. I mean, even in a computer, what you see on the desktop is certainly not what's happening in the innards of the computer. It um, actually forgets most of that in order for us to be able to function. Um, <clears throat> so. You could say a lot of people have objected to this by saying that, you, you know, uh, why don't you just step in front of a train? Um, uh, the idea here is that we've evolved to take these things literally, to take what we see literally, but not seriously in the sense that we don't necessarily have to believe that that's objective reality, but we do take it literally. Um, I wouldn't let the icon of me step in front of the icon of a train, just as I wouldn't, you know, as Don Hoffman says, click on the icon of my thesis on, and and put and put it in the icon of the trash, because I take them, I take them seriously, not literally. I think I said it backwards earlier. Um, so the suggestion is that if evolution faces interfaces, favors interfaces as perceptual strategies, and if, for example, space is a construction existing in a species-dependent mind, this invites us to start anew in developing a model of consciousness. And I say model uh, because it's not really a theory. We, we, 
you know, in, in any in any theory or model, you have to start somewhere. And our suggestion is that we're going to start with consciousness. Um, but before we get there, let's just ask, what is a conscious agent? So it inter a conscious agent is something that interacts by means of perceptions and actions with its world. So let's try to parsimoniously describe a conscious agent in a manner that's inspired by Turing, who introduced a formal model of com computation um, um, and defined a Turing machine. And then the church Turing thesis says, which is a falsifiable thesis, says that every uh, uh, every computation can be performed by a Turing machine. So in a similar way, um, we're going to define a conscious agent and the essential elements of a conscious agent is, is that, first of all, it has experiences, um, perceptions, qualia, and so forth. Um, the experiences lead to the decision to act, and the actions are something that are happening in uh, on a world. Um, and then the loop is completed by uh, the, uh, having further experiences in interacting with the world. Okay, so we're, we're taking this as, as the basic elements of a conscious agent. Uh, we'll call them W, X, and G for world perception space and uh, action space. Um, P is your perceptual map, which we described earlier on. D is a decision map. Um, and A is an action map. So once, we've, once we have a perception, we make a decision that leads to something in G. Having chosen something in G, we perform an action which affects the world state W and, and so forth. Um, so N is a counter, which simply describes how many of these loops we've gone through. And um, you can choose any one of these uh, arrows as counting N. We can think of when, whenever you make a decision, that's when N updates by one. And so a conscious agent is this seven tuple, but in more detail, um, these spaces are taken to be probability spaces. And of course, is a, is a positive integer. Um, and then these mappings from one space to another are Markovian kernels, which allows for dispersion. Um, for various reasons, we decided to include uh, the, the previous um, loop in, in the following way. For each world state W, current world state W, and the previous percept X, the current percept is given by this Markovian kernel. Okay, so the, the probability of the current percept, that bullet over there, is given by P, W, X. Um, and then that's the probability of the new percept. So that's a probability on X. And similarly, um, D is a probability on G. And similarly, A is a probability on W. Okay, and so this particular seven tuple is what we call a Markovian kernel. Now, if we forget about the previous states, which are given in by these second um, uh, arguments, then we would call it a forgetful uh, kernel. And we do do that in some situations. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to point out that using Markovian kernels uh, both allows us to describe uh, the, the dispersiveness of perceptions and actions in the world, but it also opens the possibility of, of a description of free will. And that's all I can say about that at the moment. Okay, so our conscious agent thesis, uh, in analogy with, with previous theses, is that every conscious entity and its activity can be modeled by conscious agents. Um, this is, again, it's a falsifiable thesis, and it's... Um, um, it's something which we're going to take as the basis of further developments. Okay, so I want to describe the uh, the theorem about invention of space. Um, and I, we think of space as a set of points, we'll call it S, determined by a fixed number of parameters, usually with a metric. Um, for example, three-dimensional space um, of Euclidean geometry. Um, uh, or the three dimensions of space with one dimension of time in space time, which has four dimensions of parameters and so on. But it's not just a set of points, it's also a, a, a set of points together with a symmetry group. So it's a symmetry group is, is a group that acts on the space. It, it 
transports elements of the space to other elements of the space. Um, and it preserves congruency of certain figures. So um, in many situations, of course, we're talking about Lee groups acting on manifolds uh, via faithful transitive group actions. Um, uh, so, for example, the Euclidean group acts on R3 to give us Euclidean geometry in, in three space. The Lorentz group acting on Minkowski four space gives us uh, relativity and so forth. Um, but it, we can just think of, of a space uh, or a geometry in this sense as a set together with a symmetry group. Um, then, loosely speaking, the invention of space theorem says that if you have a conscious agent whose actions form a group, we very suggestively called it G to begin with, um, but suppose these, this is actually a group of possible actions. And um, if the agent's perceptions in some sense are tuned to its actions, then the agent will, quote, see the geometrical space for that group. It'll see the world in that way. Um, and more specifically, the theorem says the following. Um, Suppose that a conscious agent's action space G has the structure of a group, and, and moreover, the G is a symmetry group for the agent's perceptual space. Um, so this is something that evolution could actually effect, um, we believe. Um, so suppose that you have this situation where even though G is something that's acting on W, it happens to have become a, a symmetry group for X. Um, or some aspect of x then we write this action as g dot x whenever the group element g acts on x g however actually acts on the world okay so for any little g in in uh, in big g and the current world state w the new world state is given by that uh, what it was a markovian kernel but we're thinking of this as as a function now as a dirac kernel point mass um, if the new world state is AGW, okay, so that's, uh, you could call it a W prime if you like, it's, it's sitting in W. The action of G on the world need not be a group action. In fact, there's good reasons to think it never will be. Um, the world is simply too big. You're going to have trajectories going through the world which will be minuscule compared to the rest of the world. And so you certainly won't have a transitive group action. Um, but if the perceptual, channel P and the action channel A are attuned, by which we mean the following formula, then we, f we mean that the new percept is going to be simply G acting on X. Um, then the perception action experiences of this observer, observer will admit G as a group of symmetries on the fibers of P in the world. You see, the, the um, conscious agent only sees in the world, it sees its fibers. And it, and if there's a group action on X, there's automatically a group action on its fibers. And that's what it's seeing. And it will see the world as having the geometry that it itself effectively has. Okay, so proving these theorems is actually quite trivial. It's, it's stating them is, is the one that is, is what requires a certain amount of um, development. Uh, but, the conclusion is that the observer sees a spatial structure in the world given by the symmetry group G, but it is the agent that has this structure. The world may not have this structure. Um, and I think I only have about 15 minutes left. I know so... we started late, so don't don't hurry. Uh, by oh, the way, okay. may I just say the webcam, so could you tilt it a bit because you're slowly fading I'm out. I'm disappearing. Of Thank okay. you, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I was sliding down in my chair also. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, the, the third theorem then is the invention of probabilistic structure. Um, again, it's, uh, the, uh, it, it's about seeing uh, structures in the world that actually belong only to the agent itself. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, what I'm going to define over here is called a reduced conscious agent. A reduced conscious agent is, is a, an agent in which we don't uh, apply any uh, a priori uh, measurable structure on the world. So X, uh, and G, uh, which are internal to the agent, they have a measurable structure. And D, the decision kernel, which goes from X to G, has is a measurable function. And then P, the perception kernel, can be any function from the world to X, or any kernel from the world to X, if you like. And A is any function from uh, the action space G 
to the world. Um, so we're not specifying any measurable structure on the world and on those functions that are related to it. Okay. Well, the fact is that if you if you have a function p that goes into a measurable space x, then it induces a measurable structure on w automatically. Um, that's a standard basic theorem in measure theory. Um, and it, it, when you induce that structure onto w, the the mapping A may or may not be measurable with respect to that new structure. If it is measurable, if it respects this induced structure, uh, in other words, this is a new kind of attunement, if you like, um, that if A and P are attuned in this fashion, then the seventuple, which was a reduced conscious agent, actually becomes a conscious agent. And again, what happens is that the agent sees a probabilistic structure in the world, even if the world does not have this structure. Okay, so um, these three theorems suggest to us that the traditional mind problem, which is a physical uh, world causes consciousness, and the physical world is fundamental and consciousness is emergent from that, uh, really should be reversed. Um, this is not the only reason we say so. It's also that, you know, there have been, there've been decades and decades of discoveries of uh, neural correlates of consciousness, but no one's ever been able to explain how uh, neuronal activity gives rise to the taste of chocolate, for example. And so, uh, even if we just, we take this as a working hypothesis, we I think we ought to consider that the spectacular failure of of our attempts to derive consciousness from from physics and chemistry and biochemistry, um, that spectacular failure suggests that we should consider developing the theory in the opposite direction. That take consciousness to be fundamental. Um, Try to describe some of its properties, but it's it's sort of almost axiomatic. And then the big job, the hard problem now becomes to derive the, the physical world as we see it. Um, so in this context, the conscious realism thesis is if consciousness is fundamental, then the world consists only of conscious agents, of and only of conscious agents. And again, this is a falsifiable thesis. <laughs> so. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, well, we have a lot of work to do. This is just the very beginning. Um, uh, and we have started to work on in various directions. So one of them is how do conscious agents combine statically or dynamically to produce new conscious agents? In other words, we're, we're, we'd like to uh, study how conscious agents or combinations can evolve uh, based on their experiences. Um, this presumably would solve the combination problem in philosophy. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to be able to build circuits of conscious agents. And, and we have uh, actually made some uh, progress in that direction. And to explore their properties, including things like uh, the, the capacity to, uh, to have memory, to do predictive coding, and so forth. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a clarion call uh, paper uh, published recently on this. Um, one form of the combination that I just talked about is circuits of conscious agents. So the way this uh, conscious agent is structured, uh, you can insert a conscious agent into any one of the arrows of an existing one. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it is you could, you could make the world of any one conscious agent another conscious agent. Okay. And if the conscious agent thesis is uh, taken seriously, then in fact, the rest of the world for any one conscious agent really is just another conscious agent. I mean, it may be an incredibly complicated one, but it is again a conscious agent. Um, so this is one form of combination and, and this is the beginning of developing um, uh, circuits of conscious agents. Um, that's what I just said about uh, essentially the world is a circuit of conscious agents or just another conscious agent in fact 
Um, another form of combination of conscious agents that we are exploring is the notion of asymptotic agents. You have this idea that you have two circuits of conscious agents which are sort of loosely interacting with each other but interacting somewhat vigorously with themselves. It's sort of a dynamical systems approach. Um, and uh, you look at, you, you let this interaction run uh, out to infinity and look at the asymptotic behavior that develops. And there's some research, there's some uh, work in, in Markov chain theory where, for example, with Harris chains and so forth, where the asymptotic behavior is very regular and uh, is essentially can be looked at as an interface. So each of the circuits develops asymptotically a new kind of interface in a completely different space from their own state spaces. Um, which can be then thought of as an interface of, of interaction at a different level. Um, we haven't got very far with this, but uh, there are some very suggestive ideas there. Um, another thing we need to do is to show how space-time, for example, the, the most basic physical entity emerges as uh, in the interaction in the dynamics of conscious agents. And uh, the thought here is that, that space-time emerges as an efficient coding scheme from the interaction of conscious agents. Uh, this is an idea that apparently is uh, arising completely independently within uh, physics. Physicists have been talking about efficient coding scheme uh, uh, as, as a sort of a production of space-time. But um, from our point of view, we'd like to see how that could arise from uh, conscious agents in dynamical interaction. Um, and uh, our idea here is that when conscious agents interact, there is a huge information space of their interaction. And in order to be able to um, function efficiently, an, an agent or a circuit of agents will have to develop an interface which is much, much simpler than just describing the whole uh, of information space. So we've been using um, geometric algebra as a way of, of uh, making that compression uh, just to describe the general situation. So suppose you have two uh, conscious agents interacting with each other. So each agent is the world of the other agent, essentially. Um, and uh, in, in this interaction, you, you're going around the loop, you're developing a dynamical uh, uh, Markov chain, essentially, where the, uh, the the whole space, what we call the interaction space or the information space, actually, probably a better word, um, is just the product of all the state spaces and, of course, the the counters for each of these. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the uh, perception of one is the action of the other, and so forth. Okay, so. Um, there's some suggestive ideas here. Uh, we haven't completed this work. In fact, we're, we're just about, now that I'm retiring, I'll, I'll be able to work on this with, with much more uh, vigor. Um, so the idea is to, to define a mapping between the, the very complicated information space and a, ge a geometric algebra. Now, I've taken this particular geometric algebra where um, the underlying ring actually if if m is a is a, is a prime number this is actually a field uh, it's a it's a geometric algebra you can think of it as a vector space defined over this ring it's a module over this ring um, where each of these the state spaces are taken to be uh, m bit spaces okay so um, uh, well let's put it this way if if each of these is a one bit space then m equals 2 to be correct about this. So each of the, if each of these is a one-bit space, you get a geometric algebra over, and the, it could be of any signature. Now, in this particular case, we've taken a geometric algebra of signature 2, 4, just to be suggestive, because that's the conformal algebra for space-time. Space-time has a signature of 1, 3. In other words, its basic quadratic form has uh, 1 negative and 3 positive uh, diagonal elements. The uh, uh, conformal geometry of that allows us to jump up one dimension for each of those, and it's it's a it's a good uh, ge geometry to consider because it sort of um, simplifies a lot of calculations that happen in the original geometry. So that's really what what's happening over here. But this could be any signature. We could consider compressing information space into uh, 
any vector space in its, its algebra over any finite field, which is based on the, uh, the size of the uh, state spaces. And what we see by doing this, and here's one example, if you're going to do it in the conformal uh, algebra G24, then you take the state variables, the, the, what the actual, you, you describe the states in terms of just counting. If, if there are M possibilities, then it, it's one through M. Um, and you um, take this, the state of any one um, step in the, in the Markov chain and uh, describe it as this multivector in the geometric algebra, okay? And what that does is it allows you to do a tremendous amount of compression. And here's some, a couple of plots. These are not the same geometric algebra that I talked about before. This is just a, a all positive uh, signature geometric algebra uh, where the underlying, underlying field is Z sub P. It's a the basic field of P elements. Um, and the, the plot here, this is, gives you the ratio of the cardinality of information operators, essentially the size of the information space, to the cardinality of the geometric algebra operators as, as P increases for a fixed N. So the dimension of the geometric algebra underlying vector space is fixed, okay, equal to two. Um, and you can see that there's this as, um, uh, 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 as the number of basis vectors, sorry, as as the um, the size of the scalar field increases, the compression becomes extremely dramatic. Um, this is for n equals two. For n equals three, it's even more so. Okay, so this is just some preliminary work where we'd like to uh, see how uh, um, an interface can arise uh, as an efficient coding scheme via the dynamical interaction of conscious agents. So a couple of remaining comments. Uh, what remains to be done uh, over the next, we're hoping that many generations from now we'll be able to show how objects arise as satisfying solutions to the fitness landscape of a species. Um, so a species produces objects out of its own need for survival. Um, and then we can ask other questions. For, for example, uh, is quantum theory natural? I haven't mentioned anything about quantum theory so far. And uh, it's quite possible that we may eventually need to expand our definition of the conscious agent to sort of take into account at a fundamental level quantum theory, or it's equally possible that quantum theory may arise in some way from the dynamical interaction of these, of these agents. But we can ask questions like, like this and the the fact is that we see some quantum behavior already um, in um, circuits of two agents it's quantum like behavior i don't, don't want to say it is quantum behavior it's just quantum like uh, it's suggestive that's all um, <clears throat> and we mentioned that in that paper objects of consciousness um, another question you can ask now is if physics arises from consciousness, then is physical law immutable? Is it, is it fixed or does it change in some way as consciousness evolves? Um, and that brings, you, brings us to probably the most fundamental question is what drives the evolution of consciousness? And we don't know, but there are some very deep intuitions that, that many people have had and uh, the way uh, Federico Fagin, who's, who is uh, our uh, uh, mentor in some ways and, and, and certainly our, our, uh, who, who funds our work, uh, suggested that, that what drives the evolution of consciousness is the need for consciousness to know itself. Um, so I'll leave it at that very provocative um, statement. <laughs>